I'm going to talk about smart cities. I've been thinking about smart cities for over 10 years before they were a hot topic and on everybody's mind. And really, I want to take you through the journey of smart cities so that you can kind of understand how the notion has evolved. 10 years ago, we believed that smart cities were the ones that were built with a top-down, uh, very large technical infrastructure that could only be done by very large firms. They would work with the government, and the government and these big companies would put the technical infrastructure in place. This is what it was all about. This is a cover of Barron's from 2011. And it was all about how IBM, ABB, Siemens, Cisco, uh, all of these companies are going to help. But then it evolved. Five to seven years later, by the time I was working on my PhD, we began to see it now as um, more as a platform in which many participants could contribute, large and small companies, public and private agencies. And really it was about the data and how it was utilized that made the smart city uh, livable, efficient, and productive. And for those of us in Singapore, we have evolved that even more. Some years ago, we started calling ourselves a smart nation. And the idea was to have a more holistic view, to perhaps move beyond just the infrastructure and built environment, and to think about the economy, our talent, our sustainability, and all those things. So I'm gonna talk about some examples of this and make essentially uh, two main points. The first thing that I'm gonna talk about is the case of sustainable transportation. When you are working on artificial intelligence and you're helping a government or a city, um, you, know, you are trying to address a pain point. So for example, a uh, you know, public transport company has a pain point, it wants to generate more revenue, it wants to engage customers, and it wants to solve the last mile problem. The last mile problem is what all of us have, especially when it's very hot, uh, you know, and we, we don't like to walk a lot, and there are not enough biking paths, and then we have to call a taxi, or we have to get off a bus and walk to our office or our residence. This is, by the way, a huge problem when planning transportation systems. Now, the good news is we have a lot of apps. We have e-scooter apps, we have bike sharing apps, we have a public transport apps, but they're all different apps. And this was a pain point that the public transport company decided it wanted to address because this was something that was constraining its consumers. And so the idea was, let's build a one-stop app which allows you to book any type of transportation. So it actually, you give it your origin and your destination, and it tells you what type of transport you should take to reach your destination, the optimal time, optimal cost, maybe you want to be more green, maybe you want to include your exercise goals in it, and it uh, is able to allow you to book and pay for it all seamlessly. Now, when we design smart city applications for citizens, um, you know, the citizens don't care about the complexity behind whatever you may be doing. Whether you're outfitting a building or you're working in a transport system, they just want convenience. And keeping that in mind is very important because ultimately you're designing a product or a building or infrastructure for citizens. And in this case, they wanted to search, book, and pay seamlessly in one app. But behind the scenes, this is what is happening. It's data integration. And because we are an AI firm, we work with lots of partners to integrate data. And this is very important. So you need traffic data, you need weather data, you need the data from e-scooters, companies, from public transport, from the trains, from the buses. And there's an element of negotiation and consensus and alignment that goes behind conducting this um, data integration. 
And once you've done that, then you can start using artificial intelligence. Because now you know how people are moving around the city, so you can make recommendations to them, you can give them discounted offers, um, they may have a preference, as I said, they want to be more green, or they want to, they don't mind spending more money, but they want to get faster to a place. And so we began to integrate, this is an NTU, and you can see that we helped the company integrate buses, trains, bike sharing, scooter sharing, um, on-demand shuttles, all of this to create an easier and more convenient way for the citizen to move around the city. Now, how can AI further boost the solution? Once you know how people are moving around, then you can actually pr do predictive analytics. And when you can do predictive analytics, you can optimize traffic so that there's less congestion. So that you can tell people that, you know, when there's an event, or maybe when there are exams, students don't like to use bikes. In fact, they like to uh, study and read in buses or autonomous vehicles, so we should have more of those at certain locations. We found out that students would be happy to take e-scooters if they were in a certain location. But the company had never thought of that, but by observing the behavior of the students, we recommended it, and the usage went up by 50%. And, it was, um, and the students were very happy. And if you even take it further, where should you put your bus stops? Where should you have your next building? A number of these conversations should be based on the movement of people around the city, where they live, what their preferences are. Now, this was then the company that we were talking about, was SMRT, we talked a lot of bold leadership for them to do this. Um, and then they spun out, and they are now called Zipster. It was it received funding, Series A funding by Toyota, and I think it's an example of how, with the right partnership, even companies, large companies, uh, public transport companies, can innovate and come up with partnership and ecosystem models that Hayorza had they had never done before. Now, once you start doing this, once you start building a platform, what's stopping you from adding more services? Now, let's say you could add driverless taxis to it. Um, after that, maybe if you're in Dubai, you can add a Hyperloop train to it. So as you build these platforms that are essentially integrated ecosystems, you are now opening the door to a lot of smaller, bigger, private and public sector companies to come together. And then after that, uh, you could put flying cars. I know we're experimenting with flying taxis here in Singapore as well. Or even more, you could even do car insurance. So you put a fintech layer on it, an insure tech layer on it. Again, the idea is more convenience for the citizen eventually. And this is all done through the use of data integration and um, through the use of artificial intelligence. So I think my lesson for the built environment would be that ecosystems of public-private partnerships make up the smart city, not large companies or just government-led agencies. That the infrastructure itself 